Hammer Film Productions, best known for revolutionizing the classic monsters with dark, sexy, and often bloody takes set in a gothic world that just oozed an atmosphere. Hammer made the period piece an art form, but the company did not come to be with the release of The Curse of Frankenstein in 1957. In fact, the first Hammer release was the 1935 Lost film, The Public Life of Henry IX, a comedy. But where things truly began, at least for viewers of this channel, was the 1955 film adaption of the Quatermass Experiment serial, a science fiction picture and unexpected hit, one that would forever change the course of Hammer film productions. And it would not be the only sci-fi film that Hammer released during the classic period. The following mini-documentary will take a look at five classic Hammer sci-fi films. This is not a ranking or a top list, just a presentation and order of release. Directed by Terence Fisher, who is easily best known for his work with Hammer, having directed many of the company's finest releases, Spaceways is essentially a sci-fi murder mystery with touches of Cold War thriller. And it tells the story of a group of dysfunctional scientists, and two of the scientists disappear just before the launch of a new satellite that will permanently orbit the Earth. Soon, the conclusion is reached that the two were murdered by our lead, who then has to prove his innocence. And of course, he can only do that by going into space himself. Spaceways starred American actor Howard Duff. A radio star turned actor, he also did a bit of TV, including the season one episode of The Twilight Zone, A World of Difference, written by Richard Matheson. Duff's most memorable radio role was that of Private Eye Sam Spade in The Adventures of Sam Spade that ran from 1946 to 1950. But genre picture and B-movie fans may know him best from his role in the 1986 film Monster in the Closet. Spaceways was actually Hammer's second sci-fi film. Four-Sided Triangle, which was also directed by Terence Fisher, was the first, opening just a month beforehand. It was an adaptation of the story of the same name by British sci-fi writer William F. Temple. But back to Spaceways. It was filmed entirely in the UK, but featured American film producer and theater owner Robert L. Lippert as co-producer. Lippert financed many films, including the original Fly, and his company, Lippert Films, produced many as well, including Rocket Ship XM from 1950, of which some scenes were reused for Spaceways. Directed by Leslie Norman, an accomplished editor, producer, and director responsible for the 1958 war film Dunkirk, X the Unknown is a sci-fi borderline creature feature, and it tells the story of the British military who discover a mysterious source of radiation. After an explosion, a seemingly bottomless crack appears in the surface and an ancient creature from the prehistory of Earth secretly emerges from the crack to feed on radioactivity. So an American scientist is called in to investigate what is going on. The film stars Dean Jagger as our American scientist. Jagger was in many films, including King Creole with Elvis, but like Howard Duff before him, he appeared on The Twilight Zone, the episode Static, one of the six season two episodes shot on videotape to cut cost. He also appeared in the 1980 film Alligator. X the Unknown is an interesting case because it was originally meant to be the sequel to the highly successful Quatermass experiment, and you can certainly see it too. And though Jagger did a fine job, I couldn't help but picture what Brian Donlevy would have done in the same situation. He certainly wouldn't have taken as much guff, that's for sure. But Quatermass writer Nigel Neal refused permission to use the character, so it was revamped, though I don't imagine by too much, into X the Unknown. Another big change in production came in the form of the director. Originally, American filmmaker Joseph Losey was to direct. He had moved to the UK after being put on the Hollywood blacklist of the early years of the Cold War. Supposedly, he actually did shoot some footage that can be seen in the final cut, but he was replaced very early on by Norman. As to why, the popular theory is that star Dean Jagger just did not want to work with him because of the blacklisting, but publicly it was said because of illness. 
Yet another interesting thing about X the Unknown is that it was one of the first movies with a blob-like monster, even predating the blob itself. Directed by Val Guest, who directed the first Quatermass film, Quatermass 2 is based on the serial of the mostly same name. The film using a 2, the serial of the Roman numerals. And it tells the story of curmudgeonly scientist Dr. Bernard Quatermass as he struggles to gain support for a colony on the moon. He soon finds himself right in the middle of a government conspiracy. A conspiracy that just happens to involve the alien infiltration of the highest levels of the British government. And of course, our headstrong American lead, he isn't having that. And if anyone is wondering why I'm skipping over the first film, I actually covered it in full right here on the channel already. Quatermass 2 stars American tough guy actor Brian Donlevy, reprising his role from the first film. Donlevy had a vast film career, doing everything from sci-fi all the way to how to stuff a wild bikini in the American version of the first Gamera film. Don Levy's portrayal of Quatermass came in stark contrast to that of the TV version, who was much more refined and British. Writer Nigel Neal, who had written the two TV serials, was unhappy with both the first film and Don Levy's take on the character. It also didn't help that he was technically an employee of the BBC and received no extra money from the sale. I would imagine this is what led to his refusal to allow Quatermass to be used in the aforementioned X The Unknown. Neil, though, would be allowed to write the first draft of the screenplay for Quatermass 2, which basically condensed the events of the second serial. Director Val Guest would work on additional drafts. It is also worth noting that though the film is fairly faithful to the serial, the two have much different endings. Much like the first film, which was retitled The Creeping Unknown for its American release, Quatermass 2 also saw a title change. This new title, which I actually did quite a bit, was Enemy from Space and it was due to the American distribution that the film was able to have a significantly higher budget this time around. Hammer pre-sold the rights, which would from here on become the normal practice for the company. Quatermass 2 was another big success for Hammer, but it would pale in comparison to The Curse of Frankenstein, released that same month. And the massive success of that film completely changed the direction of the company. It would be 10 years before Hammer did another Quatermass film, the much-loved Quatermass and the Pit. Written, directed, and produced by Michael Carreras, who produced more Hammer films than you can shake a stick at, The Lost Continent was a co-production between Hammer and Seven Arts Productions. Seven Arts was a production company which basically made films for other studios, and they would work with Hammer many times with output including The Devil Rides Out, more on that in a moment, sorta, and Rasputin the Mad Monk. But The Lost Continent tells the story of a shady freighter full of shady people who, through shady adjacent reasons, find themselves in all kinds of trouble when they encounter killer seaweed, sea monsters, and a centuries-old Spanish galleon manned by the descendants of the original crew that got stuck in the very same seaweedy place. This one is really unique, over-the-top, and downright wacky for a Hammer film, and it stars stage and film actor Eric Porter as the captain of the ship. Porter, at least for viewers of this channel, is probably best known for this very film. It also features Susanna Leigh of Hammer's Lust for a Vampire and Neil McCallum of Moon Zero Two. The film was based on a novel by Dennis Wheatley called Uncharted Seas, which you can actually see in a scene in the film. Wheatley is probably best known for his thrillers and occult-themed stories, including the aforementioned Devil Rides Out. When production began on The Lost Continent, Leslie Norman of X the Unknown was set to direct, but for reasons I was unable to find, he was supposedly fired by producer Michael Correas, and Correas then took over as director. Correas also just happened to be the son of Hammer founder, James Correas, and oddly enough, the film was rated X when it was first released. This is another I would call a borderline creature feature, with some really spiffy creature designs. Quite a few people are credited with the special effects of the film, but I did want to highlight Robert A. Maddy, a former Disneyland animatronic designer who would go on to help create a friendly little shark by the name of Bruce for a friendly little shark movie called Jaws. <laughs> 
Directed by Roy Ward Baker, the man behind The Vampire Lovers, The Monster Club, and Quatermass in the Pit, Moon Zero Two is a stylish sci-fi film that was billed as the first moon western in the U.S., though that's more so in plot than it is visually, and it tells the story of the distant future year of 2021. The moon is being colonized, a new frontier of sorts, and multiple settlements have formed. And one of the moon citizens, who happens to be a millionaire, hears of a small asteroid made of sapphire that's in low orbit. He then hires a former astronaut turned salvager to transport it to the surface. But wouldn't you know, that's against Space Corporation law. And thus the caper begins. This one featured a screenplay by Michael Correas, who you may remember from The Lost Continent. And the effects were overseen by Les Bowie, who worked on The Crawling Eye, The Day the Earth Caught Fire, and Quatermass in the Pit. But as unique and groovy as Moon Zero Two was, it was not a big hit. In an interview with Starlog Magazine, Roy Ward Baker attributed this, in part, to the fact that the actual moon landing had just recently taken place and had kind of stolen their thunder. The jerks. Now let's dig into some supposedlies. This was Hammer's most expensive feature of the time. But because the film only broke even, they decided to steer clear of traditional sci-fi for a while and sold off many of the props and sets. Said props and sets supposedly went to productions such as UFO from 1970, Space 1999 from 75, and Superman 2 from 1980. Another supposedly, one that's since been debunked, was that the film reused sets from Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, but this is apparently not the case. And that was just a brief look at some of the sci-fi output of the great Hammer films. Perhaps we will meet again in the distant future year of 2021 to discuss a few more.